Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first annual 5050 Day. I know that we have people in over 65 countries. There are over 10 or 11,000 events happening in all 50 states. Um, and we're just so excited to have you all here. And we have an amazing, amazing first speaker, speaker who I'm just so honored to have here. Um, I am now going to introduce live from New York. Rosie Rios was the 43rd treasurer of the United States. Her signature has been printed on $1.2 trillion out of the $1.4 trillion in circulation. She is known for leading efforts to place a portrait of a woman on the front of U.S. currency for the first time in the nation's history. Treasurer Rios continues ad advocacy for women and girls and has launched Empowerment 2020 at Harvard. Its first project, The Teachers Writing History, highlights the contributions of important women. So welcome, welcome as our first illustrious speaker mm -hmm. on 5050 Day. It's so nice to have you. Thank you, Tiffany. It's really an honor and thank you for this invitation. So I think my first question, because the way that I met you, which was super exciting, was when you signed the $20 bill that I gave to my daughters. And that that was, tell me about a little bit about what it's like to mark a woman on currency. Tell me what that experience and process leading up to that was. Yeah, it was, um, you know, it, it, it actually occurred during my time on the Treasury Federal Reserve Transition Team when I, uh, when I first came into to DC back in the fall of 2008. And for anyone who doesn't know that I saw the Bureau of Engraving and Printing and the US Mint, and that's the Bureau of Engraving and Printing or the BEP, they actually made all the financial products of the federal government, not just currency. So it was, you know, savings bonds, postage stamps, food stamps, military payment certificates. And literally one day I'm pouring through the archives of the Historic Resource Center. And over time, it just became perfectly obvious that every image of a woman that I came across for all these concepts and renderings that were used in all these products, all these women were allegorical. They weren't real women. And in some cases, you know, not clothed, but every single image of a man was a real man, a cabinet member, a founding father, all perfectly clothed. And, and it dawned on me that if, you know, this is the way we institutionalize our history, right? And so if you think about every, every denomination of coin and currency always has a very important person on the front and a very symbolic edifice on the back. And so this is the way we document the story of our country. Why are we missing half the population? And then when you look at other countries at that time, there were, you know, several dozen countries who had women on the modern day currency and I couldn't really understand why we weren't one of them. So I asked the, the, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing staff, I asked the, the, the executive director, uh, his deputy, his deputy, they all had the same answer. No one's ever brought it up. So no I, one's ever asked, isn't that? <laughs> I, bring it up, bring yeah, it up. Bring it up. So, so, it's well, yeah, well, and it's why I took the job. It's why I moved my family out from California. My, my daughter at the time was eight, my son was 12. And, and for me, I knew it was something that, that needed to happen. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about a woman appearing on currency. Yeah, when so, that can happen, talk to us. Yeah, so, so what's important for people to know is the first and foremost reason why currency is redesigned is security. And, and I was part of the, the, the counterfeiting group that monitored currency, uh, excuse me, it's um, counterfeiting, excuse me, uh, counterfeiting. And so when we um, when were looking at, at uh, what note to be next in line, it was actually the, the $10 bill. And uh, so for, for, for us um, to redesign currency, it was important to come up with a theme. And the theme that I had recommended way back when, who'd have thought it would be so relevant today, was the theme of democracy. And knowing that we were working towards this timeline of 2020, it dawned on me, big light bulb, many years ago, that 2020 is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote. So August 26, 2020. So how much more of a democracy does it represent to have half your population participate in the governance process? And so that's how it turns into this concept of focusing on historic American women. It's amazing. And, you know, I, I, I think the, the idea that you're also rolling out, I think I, when I first heard you speak, you talked about that there's plans for many more. It is not just, you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's nice for people to know this will not be a one and only situation. You have plans in the works. Yeah. So, so the first note to be released will still be the $10 bill, but the concept is to, to honor, you know, it wasn't supposed to be about one woman. Uh, and, and, and I want to make sure that, that the people are aware 
what was discussed was the 10 and the five and then the 20 in terms of, of, of how currency is, is designed specifically because of counterfeiting threats. Uh, and so as far as I know, that's still the case, the 10, the five and the 20, but all three are intended to be unveiled uh, on August 26, 2020. So that, as far as I know, that is still uh, gonna be the case. And so for, I think what's more important though is, you know, this was never supposed to be about the 10 versus the 20, Jackson versus Hamilton. What I wanted to make sure happened was, you know, when we launched the public engagement process, I learned very, very quickly, three things I learned very quickly. One, uh, there's a lot of hate in this country. Two, uh, how little people know about American history. And three, how much less they know about women in history. So I made sure that when we uh, had this public engagement process, I collected that information. I put together this database of almost 250 historic American women. And I made sure that when we made the announcement last April, 2016, that, uh, that that entire database would be posted on the Treasury website. And so that was kind of the genesis of what became, as you know, teachers writing history. Well, actually, that's what I wanna talk about next. So now you are at this very exciting project and I would love for you to um, talk to us about teachers writing history, because it's so much, I mean, when we're talking about getting to 50-50, and one of my journeys with making the film 5050 is we need to know our history more and we need it to be at the forefront. I always feel like there's so much work left, so much further we have to go, but we need to remember how far we've come Absolutely. and the courageous women that have brought us here. So I'm just, lately I've been thinking that I'm like wearing goggles. One lens is all the courageous women who have taken us to this moment. And then the other lens is where we need to go, but we need both. I actually think a lot of times we focus a little bit too much on what we don't have and where we're not. And that it's a much better framing to come from a place of power and courage and abundance to get to where we want to go. No, that's right. And, and, and you, I think you use the operative word is lens. So I, I'm all about changing the lens and yes. it's really important to do that. So teachers writing history and that's R I G H T as in writing the wrong. Yes, yes. That, that these, what I call buried treasures, were, were, were omitted from our, from our history. And so taking that database, uh, what happened was literally in August of 2015, I, I got an email from my high school history teacher, uh, whose class I took over 30 years ago. And he's still there teaching at my high school, in, in uh, Moreau High School in Hayward. And uh, he's been there now, I think, 36 years. But he sends me this email. And he saw my CNN video on, on the redesign process and he wanted to congratulate me, but he also wanted to thank me because that was the first day of the school year. And he said that he walked into the classroom that morning and after you know 35 years of teaching American history, he realized that he had no images of women on his walls and he wanted to change it. And he did, he invited me back that fall. I walked in, there's Susan B. Anthony, Harry Tubman and me. It was very exciting, but it dawned on me, my gosh, if one teacher or a hundred teachers or a thousand teachers did the same thing. Can you imagine what that does for our girls and our boys, right? Yes. It, 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 it's, it's actually not gender centric. It's actually gender neutral. So when you think about this, you know, as one, uh, one uh, young a feminist interest, this is just the story of our country. And that's exactly right. This is not his story or her story. This is our story. Mm. And so I intentionally launched Teachers Writing History uh, last August, August 26th, of course, all, always on Equality Day. <laughs> and it took off like gangbusters. So my high school was the prototype. They're the ones who wanted to kind of launch this effort. It's basically taking this database and integrating it into the classroom. However one wants to integrate it, whether it's images on a wall, mm. whether it's, you know, games, apps, performance pieces, uh, science classes, math classes. The whole bottom line is we need inspirations in order to have aspirations. So if all you see and you walk around and you see the same thing every time, how do you know what your potential is? How do you know what your options are? And so, uh, you know, it begins with our history. You do have to go back in order to go forward. I, I, it's kind of my little theme now. History's making a comeback. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, everything even with the Hamilton, I love that we're bringing history to life. And my Absolutely. father wrote a lot about history and we need to make it exciting, more exciting, which I think things like Hamilton, your project, um, you know, in my film 5050, just bringing these stories to life is so crucial. And I love what you said about this isn't just for women, it's for the sons and daughters in the classrooms, however you identify um, that this is about seeing an accurate reflection of our story and 
our history and the, the value that we place on everyone in society. No, no absolutely. And, and, and so, you know, here I've been talking about this this whole time. And what do you know? This last January, Science Magazine releases an article about uh, uh, when girls start to question their intellectual capacity. And there's basically three takeaways from this. It's very, very fascinating. What it says is uh, girls are uh, less likely than, six-year-old girls are less likely than boys to think they're really, really smart. Mm -hmm. And six-year-old girls are less likely to pursue activities where you have to be really, really smart. Mm -hmm. And that the biggest changes occur between the ages of five and seven. So why is that? It's it's the classroom. It's when they start school. Oh, that's fascinating. I just got yes, yes. So it's so it's you know it's whether it's you know mean girls or, or whether it's boys or whether it's the teachers who don't call them or maybe it's what they don't see, right? So it's it's so it's like a play on unconscious bias, right? So unconscious bias is when you don't realize that you're being influenced by something you're exposed to. So could it be that you don't realize that you're being influenced by something you're not exposed to? And the answer is of course. So this isn't something that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do. I'm doing this because it's damaging if we don't. So I think about this as an equity issue. So, you know, whether you have a daughter, a granddaughter, a niece, a cousin, et cetera, if they're left behind at such an early age, well, anytime, but at such an early age where we are literally damaging their confidence and their ability to pursue their full potential, then we all lose. We all lose. Yes, I completely agree. And I feel like, I mean, it's such a, I'm so happy that you're in the education system because that is truly where the change is gonna, it, that's where it needs to start. Yeah. And I guess, I think I wanna close with, what gives you hope right now? I mean, I think I always <laughs> like to end on that because it's important amongst all the things that, um, we want to change, but are there are there moments that give you hope? Absolutely. Um, that you're seeing? Uh, I have two very strong uh, moments of hope at the moment. Uh, my 16 year old daughter, who's definitely going to rule the world. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that um, that she is capable and she feels like she's capable of anything. And that's very, very important. And I, I you know, my last kernel of hope uh, really just came this last weekend. True story. Uh, I just spent the weekend with my son. Uh, so I'm a visiting scholar at Harvard. He's he, he's a sophomore at Harvard, and uh, we spent the weekend together. And Friday night, his final econ paper was due at midnight, and and he brought his work with him because he's furiously trying to get it in that Friday night, and 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 he ends up turning it in, and he says, you know, mom, do you want to take a look at it? Oh, absolutely, sure. So he shows me on his laptop this 35-page research paper was on the gender wage gap. Oh. And I'm looking at oh. him. What? How? I just I was shocked. Yeah, I, was I would like this. the tears. I mean, that's so beautiful that from you. Him. Your what? son. Oh. I, this is my 21 year old son oh. writing about the gender wage gap in the U.S. Complete with a regression analysis, a very thorough, oh. thorough understanding of all the, the all the the data, the metrics, the the, the analysis, the recommendation. I was shocked. And I asked him, I said, what inspired you to choose this topic? He said, well, he says, you know, we've been having to think about our final paper for a long time now. They've been bringing in kind of, you know, different perspectives of, of certain themes. We had to do something on labor. And I, you know, he says, you know, he says, I'm going to be okay. I don't know if Brookie's going to be okay. And, and so, you know, for him to think about his sister and her future, it all just came together for me. You have this young, these young kids, these you know, millennials and post millennials, who actually feel that they need to do something. Because again, for him, it was an equity issue. It was about his sister, and well, and, and so for me, I think that's the best hope I can have is that this next generation is gonna is gonna understand what that means um, in terms of an equity issue. That's such a beautiful way to close. I love that story. I want to read that research paper. <laughs> we'll post it on our getting. To right. I told him. I said, Joey, I am going to publish that. You have no idea. Oh, so, that's yeah. such a be beautiful. The future, our children raising the next generation, lifting the next one up, having everyone, men, women, all genders, however you identify, wanting to Absolutely. gender balanced world. I love that. 
Um, thank you so much for being on and kicking off 5050 Day. I can't think of a better person. You're so inspiring. <laughs> Congratulations to you, Tiffany. What you're doing and your leadership to really uh, make everyone aware and everyone participate uh, means everything. And I know for you, this is just the beginning as well. Thank you. Have a great day in New York there. Thank you.